palate. Topamax also with uh, genital urinary types of malformations. This is a spina bifida. This is what it looks like when you're exposed to Depakote, the 1 to 2 percent that you'll hear spoken about. This is actually an outpocketing of the spinal cord and the nerves that go to the uh, bladder and the legs. But the news is happy because 90 percent of women have perfectly normal, healthy babies. Yes, there's some things that we have to watch out for, but most do amazingly well. I think it's some inherent tendency for, for people to survive. But this is one of the treatment approaches I want to try to hammer home because video monitoring that I'm showing you down here has been so critical to advance our understanding of epilepsy, the type of epilepsy, and the treatment of epilepsy. It probably represents one of the cornerstones uh, to our advances. But with a newly diagnosed one drug exposure, if that doesn't work, a second drug exposure, as you saw earlier, it's much, much less the second time around. So the response to drug number one is the most critical likelihood of whether somebody's going to respond to drug treatment at all. After the second drug failure, then we recommend video monitoring to try to figure out, is this somebody that's got some other condition? Or if this somebody that has epilepsy, are they going to remain refractory and are they a candidate for additional treatment, such as epilepsy surgery? Because if they're not, they cycle through drug number three and four and five and six and seven and so on and so on and so on. Drug resistance now starts at two. You saw the numbers that were presented by Dr. Abrams and Dr. Sheth earlier. But about half respond to drug number one. And that's pretty good. So you're optimistic right from the get-go. When they fail drug number one and go to drug number two, 13 percent, 14, 15, maybe even a little bit higher, but not much more than that. Okay, drug number two, also you're optimistic. Drug number three, less than 5 percent are going to respond. So that is the new definition of what we refer to as drug-resistant epilepsy, failure of two drugs in appropriate doses for an appropriate period of time to consider them as drug failure, two drugs. Drug resistance uh, is usually uh, seen right from the get-go. In children, they actually may have a higher initial response, but then there's a greater likelihood of loss down the road. So. The definition of drug resistance is in terms of how are you defining seizure control. If you define it other than zero seizures, you're really not talking about seizure uh, control. If you're looking at it for the first three months, which is what many drug studies do, you really don't give somebody the benefit of looking at a more protracted period of time that might represent their life more adequately. So we have 24 drugs now for epilepsy. It's an exciting time. We have five new ones in the last two years. That's pretty dramatic because before 1993, it was 15 years before we had anything beyond Dilantin, Tegretol, Phenobarb, Mycelene, and Zorantin. So we have more than tripled the initial market in terms of what we have available, and that's good because now we can individualize therapy for individuals based on their tolerability, efficacy, and safety. The new ones are usually indicated for severe epilepsy right now, and I will tell you that while Lacosamide or Vimpat that was represented here earlier um, by the vendors indicated for refractory partial seizures in adult, rufinamide or Banzel, atonic seizures, drop attacks in the lennox gasto syndrome. By Gabitrin, very interesting, Sabril approved for both spasms in children and also focal seizures in adult. And isogabine, which is a new mechanism drug, Potiba, Potiga, that will be available in the near future for partial epilepsy in adults. So we have new drugs that are on the market. They're working different. They're um, occupying various spots that might be useful for different uh, areas within epilepsy, and they all have different um, 
uh, safety profiles to be considered. So what about the future and where are we headed with drugs? Well, you heard it mentioned earlier about the idea of suicidality. This has really been brought to a head recently by the FDA when they almost black boxed uh, all of our seizure medication as a class effect. This was based on small numbers and this was based on a scientific design that included the regulatory information that led to drug approval for about 11 different drugs. But what they found was that patients with uh, uh, epilepsy treated with a newer medicine at a higher rate, rate of suicide than those treated with placebo. We now know through emerging evidence that it's probably more a reflection of depression and the types of drug that have, have been utilized in the, in the treatment regimen, such as uh, Keppra or Mysoline or Phenobarbital or Topamax, some of the higher risk drugs that can have neuropsychiatric consequences. Driving behavior, we recently uh, published some, some work looking at patients that have a uh, driving behavior. Uh, there's been a big thrust, uh, it kind of comes and goes on the legislative level about should we make sure that everybody reports themselves to the state that has one seizure. It still happens that way in some states, but not in our state. In our state, you must be six months seizure free of any seizure type before you're legally eligible to operate a motor vehicle, and there's no mandatory physician reporting. We found in our recent study that patients' behaviors in the clinic can actually be the tip off as to who will be the one to obey the law and who will not obey the law. And it's as you think, the ones that, that, that say, I've got to drive, I've got to drive, I've got to drive. Those are the ones to watch out for. And regardless of how you know, fervently the family or the doctor tell the individuals they can't drive, they do. They're the ones that are the high risk individuals for disobedience and car accidents that you see over here. The greatest advances are coming on pharmacogenomics. That's just a fancy f f term for let's look at genetics to see if we can't predict how people are going to do with their drugs. Great idea. It's led to this individualized therapy that's wonderful and based on the genetics of an individual because we've now solved the human genome. We know what makes the genetics of an individual work. What we're identifying now are individuals that are at risk for some of these serious side effects like Stevens-Johnson syndrome, such as toxic epidermolysis necrosis, that have a risk of death. And we're able to predict, based on genetic testing, who is most likely to have that reaction. The, the first uh, drugs that have been associated with this are drugs like Tegretol and Trileptol in Asians and Han Chinese but it's going to extend to other populations and it's going to extend hopefully in the future to efficacy. So we'll be able to identify based on genetic testing whether you are pre-programmed to develop drug resistant localization related epilepsy and rather than going the 20 years before you have epilepsy surgery, perhaps being able to identify you early on so you can have your operation when you're 20 instead of 60 or 40 or whatever. So very exciting. We have advances in epilepsy surgery. We have new techniques. Uh, we have epilepsy surgery centers that are becoming commonplace now, which is a good thing. And a third, yes, are drug resistant. Delays, yes, are long. But the long-term outcome is very good. There's actually, in the United States, our inability to study medicine versus surgery. But in Canada, they could. And they did. And the surgery was more effective than best medical therapy. We know that quality of life is better after surgery. We know that many are seizure free, not 100%, and you have to pick the patients wisely. And we see about a third that are cured of their illness. That means no drugs, no seizures. That's a cure in neurology, very, very rare. Here's that study I was showing you. This is the study by Sam Weeb that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a very, very popular journal. This is important to us because 
we have more than 2.5 million people with epilepsy in the United States. That is 900,000 that have drug-resistant epilepsy. That is 300,000 roughly based on a third that are surgical candidates. That is more than 200,000 that have temporal lobe epilepsy and are drug resistant and are surgical candidates. That is 140,000 that have a spot on their brain and could probably rival about 70 to 90 percent seizure free outcomes, but less than 5 percent of pa less than 5,000 patients are operated on yearly. So is that an advance? despite the practice parameters that direct neurologic care? I don't think so. But we have new techniques that are becoming more available. We have innovations within MRI, high resolution MRIs, epilepsy protocol MRIs. So after you've had three MRIs and you come to Mayo and we say, we want to get another MRI, the reason we do is because it's performed a little bit differently. It's performed with a dedicated protocol to point out various areas that might not be as evidence, like look, looking for the needle in the haystack. But this is pathology, these areas here that often show up on MRI. It may be in the inside part, the outside part, it may be the whole part, it may be outside of an area that we think has an operation, or it may be very restricted to one small focal area. Anatomy is very, very, very important, probably the most critical advance that we've had to, um, uh, we've, we've had the opportunity to enjoy. But there's other functional uh, advances that have occurred in EEG, magneto EEG, looking at magnetic waves, tractography you saw earlier, PET scanning with metabolism, um, spectroscopy with neurochemistry that's now able to be um, evaluated to functional MRI looking at blood vessels and blood vessel problems that can occur to the neuropsychological testing and WADA testing that is very helpful as well. That's an example of a PET scan, focal hypometabolism here, right temporal. MRI is a test of choice for everybody with focal epilepsy, period, end of story. Visual inspection's good. Can anybody find the abnormality? Oop, that's not it. It's right there. Right there. High field strengths may improve detection. Needle in the haystack, right there, a small area of focal cortical dysplasia. That's on a three Tesla magnet. This is something you haven't seen. This is a seven Tesla magnet. This is coming down the pike in the future for human studies. This is where we're able to now see cellular level MRI to see if there is an abnormality. At Mayo, we have an intraoperative MRI. It's the only one in the state so that we can go back and look at our resections to determine if they're acceptable or not. Networks is the big buzzword now in epilepsy, and we're finding that, as you saw earlier, diffusion tensor imaging that looks at the white matter tracks is able to be used to help guide surgery, to help guide eliminating the possibility of weakness after surgery in concert with the other tools that we have to look at um, anatomy and other functional uh, physiologies. Functional MRI is a way to look at the function based on blood flow. fMRI, you've probably heard of or may have heard of, it has to do with the MRI of deoxygenated blood, and that's relative to blood flow. We're correlating it with various functions of the brain. It may actually at some point replace the WADA test that I'm showing you here. It may actually develop seizure localization or cognitive function over time. The patient is counting backwards and medicine is being instilled into one of the major arteries that goes to the brain on the right side because we think they have right temporal lobe epilepsy. They become temporarily paralyzed. During that time, one half of the brain is denesitized and the other area is tested through neuropsychological evaluation for both language and memory.
and after one side is performed, the other side is analyzed, and the difference between the two sides is compared to predict function before surgery is performed. But we have other exciting non-surgical treatments that are available, too, for those that don't want it, for those that can't have it. Multiple subpeel transection is uh, s placing small slices on the surface of the cortex to prevent crosstalk, but not prevent head to limb conduction. So it spares the fibers talking from up and down, but it limits their spread from side to side. So big seizures become little seizures. Corpus callosal section is an option for um, individuals with mixed seizure types and drop attacks, often seen as a palliative or preventative uh, type of, of surgery. The vagus nerve stimulator is FDA approved, has been since 1997. It connects to a nerve. It's not in the brain. And it seems to have connections to the brain stem itself and other areas within the brain that are important electrically for decreasing seizure frequency. It's not felt to be a curative device. Direct brain stimulation, deep brain approved in Europe, responsive neurostimulation, slated to be um, seen for approval here in the U.S. are not and considered investigational right now and not available in the United States. Radio surgery or the gamma knife has been found to be as effective as surgery in certain cases, though the side effect profiles are very, very different, some good and some bad. The last thing I want to show you is laser treatment. I always thought it was very cool when I heard people talk about laser and how that might impact somebody with epilepsy. We now have a protocol here at the clinic that uses this techniques. This is an example of the uh, implantable uh, uh, neuropace device. Uh, we were one of the participants here for this device, this, this generator that then has electrodes into the brain to sense and deliver electrical properties, almost like a cardiac defibrillator. This is the visual A system. This uses laser energy based on temperature and with a certain degree of power, like 10.75 watts for 136 seconds, it creates a burn zone, a kill zone, if you will, of abnormal tissue at a, at a, a measurable uh, region, 25 millimeters by 15 millimeters, very eloquent. And for people that aren't candidates for surgery, this is actually an FDA-approved product that's been used in the tumor specialty for some number of years. It's now starting to be applied for patients with focal seizures. So there's still much to learn. More drugs bring new opportunity, bring more chances that there'll be uh, a hit relative to rendering someone seizure-free that has not been seizure-free in the past. The idea that drug development is simply going to start testing animals is gone. Uh, we're now looking at pharmacogenomics in a more advanced technique to try to find out and predict who's going to respond to what drug. The surgical techniques are much better. There's still uh, an underutilization despite the testing sophistication that we have, and it starts by getting the information out from conferences just like this. And so as we learn more, the focus is going to be for both kids and adults, early diagnosis to hopefully interrupt the epileptogenesis that actually creates the seizures that we're treating our, our, uh, our patients with right now. And so I think with that, I'll say uh, thank you for your kind attention.